Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed your lunch. And uh, as an announcement for this evening, um, we will have a social event um, directly after the uh, closing remarks uh, for the first day. And this event will be one floor down. So it will be on the ground floor, not uh, here. Uh, so just one level down. And now we're coming to the third panel, um, which will be on smart industry. And uh, before introducing the topic um, here in this round, I would like to uh, introduce the four panelists we do have here. Um, the first one you know already, um, Professor Dr. Gernot Spiegelberg, um, who had the keynote this morning um, already. He is actually vice president at Siemens AG's uh, Lighthouse Project uh, ECAR and previously been executive vice president and CTO at um, Siemens Fodio, uh, Video um, Automotive. Second one left to him is uh, Hubert Tadieu. Hubert is uh, since 2009 advisor to the CEO of uh, Atos, an international IT service provider, um, which is headquartered in Paris and Munich. Before that, Hubert has been executive vice president consulting and systems integration at the former Atos origin. And in addition, Hubert is chairman of the board of directors of the Fiverr Foundation. Then we have uh, Lars Nagel. Um, since this year, Lars is Managing Director of the Industrial Data Space Association, and uh, we'll come to that a bit later, what it is. An association uh, founded uh, roughly a year ago in uh, Germany. And in addition, he is Head of Innovation and Technology Transfer of, uh, efficient, of the Efficiency Cluster Management GmbH in uh, Germany. Before that, he has been founder and uh, CEO of uh, GlobalGate. And last but not least, um, Chris, how do you pronounce your name? De Kubber. Oh, that will be difficult. De Kubber. De Kubber yeah. is fine for me. Okay, from the Netherlands. From um, no, from from Belgium. From sorry, Belgium. sorry, from Belgium. No offense. Hey. No offense. Hey, hey. <laughs> And uh, Chris is uh, technical director at the European Factories of the Future Research Association, which is the private partner in the Factories of the Future PPP. Before he joined EFRA in 2010, Chris worked for Ceres and Agoria, respectively the Belgium Collective Innovation Center and Federation of Technology Industries. So these are the four panelists for smart industry, bringing with them a lot of know-how experience in the area of smart industry, of Industry 4.0. Um, but before we go into the panel discussion, let me um, introduce the topic uh, a bit to you. The Internet of Things um, is becoming the driver, really the driver of a new area of smart services. And um, it will change a lot. It will change the economy, and the economy is, uh, uh, the digitization of the economy is really accelerating. And that's not only true for smart industry, shown here uh, on of, uh, this. Not only, hey, what is that? I can't use it. So not only smart industry, and maybe within smart industry, the topic of smart factory, because smart industry is much more than uh, smart factory, but it has connections also to other domains, to smart cities, to smart mobility, um, as, for example, uh, the video, uh, again, out of you this morning, uh, showed extremely good, and we have the situation that we have marketplaces, that we have business areas which are interconnected, and information, context information, gathered in one domain might be useful and even more worth in another domain where it can be reused. And this is the area where we are talking about multi-sided marketplaces. Um, and this 
Digitization will cause disruptions, really disruptions, uh, digital disruptions in different organizations, in manufacturing companies, but also in public administrations and uh, nearly all over in our uh, daily life. It will change the business models, it will change the way of working, how we do, um, uh, how we fulfill our tasks, how we fulfill the demands of our customers. And um, disruptive technologies are coming up more and more. For example, uh, the topic within industry, this additive manufacturing, or known as uh, 3D printing, is used more and more um, in, uh, also in industrial uh, products. For example, uh, a lot of parts in the new Airbus 350 are produced using additive manufacturing. Or um, another example, for example, Adidas. Uh, Adidas is producing more than 300 million products a year, today mainly in China. And they are bringing back part of production to the customer, to the shops. And they uh, started last year, no, this year, early this year, to build a first production uh, facility for sport, sport shoes, uh, where you have the ability to go into a shop, have your shoes measured, and uh, produced a shoe in lot size one that really fits to your demands within 24 hours. And the target of Adidas is out of the 300 million um, shoes a year, or products a year, to get back 7 million by the end of this decade, um, near to the consumers being able to produce a uh, lot size one fitting to the demands of one person. Or another disruptive technology is, um, for example, augmented reality. Yeah? Enhancing uh, the real world with digital information using uh, technologies. First, uh, they started with uh, things like uh, Google Glasses, but they are not, definitely not sufficient for industrial purposes. Um, uh, now the uh, Microsoft HoloLens is a product which uh, becomes usable also in industrial um, environments. Supporting technicians, um, bringing them additional digital information um, into their view. So that are some examples for disruptive technologies, technologies enabled by the Internet of Things, by data which are collected in the Internet of Things. And uh, we see another trend, a, a major trend in industry, and that is uh, described uh, quite well, I think, in this service continuum. Um, and an analysis done by Oxford Economics uh, when they asked uh, 300 European manufacturing companies according to this service continuum. And it goes from the left with traditional product business enhanced by um, service parts business and in the middle um, field services, but field services more in a break-fix model. So if some, something breaks, we send a technician there uh, to repair that. And then it goes into the area of uh, service level contracts. We know this from, from the IT to guarantee 99.9% .9 availability of a, of a PC, of a server, uh, or of an application, for example. And that becomes more and more adapted also in the manufacturing industry to um, uh, define or to guarantee a certain availability for example, of a Siemens train driving here in Spain to say it has 99.xx percent availability for the customer. And it is on Siemens, in that case, to make that happen and make that possible. And the, the last level, and that's the so-called outcome-based service model. So not selling the product itself anymore, but the things that are coming out of that product. Very simple example, uh, a German company called Kesa uh, producing compressors. Um, normally their business is to sell the compressors to their industrial uh, customers, 
uh, which then operated to create compressed air. And with the ability to connect the compressor to the internet, to monitor the compressor, to do predictive maintenance, and Kesa knows their products better, better than their customers, and they are able to maintain and operate them more efficiently than their customers, they are just installing the compressors on site at their customers and selling not the compressor anymore, they are simply selling compressed air. And that is an example for an outcome-based service model. And coming back to the 300 companies Europe-wide, asking them, where are you today? More than 70% of them said, we are in the three left areas. Asking them, where do you want to be in five years? 95% said, we want to be at the very right. And to be able to do so, we need the Internet of Things, we need smart industry, we have the things of the Internet of Things connected to the Internet. And <clears throat> saying so, so um, we will collect data, so connection and the context information is important. Then to get insights out of this data, uh, and that's the traditional model to do data analytics uh, uh, with an outcome of recommendations, uh, what to do, um, for example, for predictive maintenance or something like that. But the next level is learning, machine learning, deep learning, how it is called, cognitive learning, decision automation. So not only providing recommendations what to do, but to autonomously decide what to do. And then we are more and more in the area of smart services. So smart industry and smart services belong very, very close together. And the last slide of my um, introduction shows this, and I mentioned it before, um, where Lars is responsible for the industrial data space. Um, but looking for, first to the vertical industry 4.0, something that uh, has been started roughly five years ago, uh, nearly at the same time when uh, the Fiverr uh, uh, community was founded and the Fiverr idea uh, became reality. At the same time, Industry 4.0 uh, has been defined uh, in Germany and uh, in the meantime grew worldwide. But it's this uh, vertical approach and the industrial data space um, has the approach to manage data. Data needed to enable smart services, which is shown um, on top of here again. So this as a little introduction, as a little warm-up for our smart industry um, session and uh, maybe to start with the uh, discussion round. The um, You've uh, heard a bit of uh, Fiverr uh, till now, and Fiverr is a complete open source approach. Um, based on my knowledge on, on industry, um, open source is not very widely uh, accepted and adapted within industry uh, till, till now. It is widely accepted within public administration. Um, so uh, maybe a first question to the round, how do you see the chance of, um, of open source technologies, of open source platforms uh, within industrial usage? Maybe just to start uh, again with you. Yeah, uh, thank you for this, um, take me for, to take me first. Um, from the point of view of the customer and, and, and the industry uh, which has to produce uh, in good efficiency and so on, they need an exchange of data really secure. And what I think they have to trust in this data exchange, uh, that it is really happen like they do it or they did it in the past. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, I think um, open source has to convince that it is really, really secure and that we can trust in this uh, data. But I think the acceptance for doing this, especially for smart and uh, for, for a small and medium uh, entities, 
um, they will trust a little bit more than big companies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Uber, you are uh, since some time now in the uh, fiber environment and uh, thinking about uh, open source. Uh, what are your source, uh, thoughts on that? Okay, I believe open source is uh, normally uh, used uh, where we do not believe there is a lot of differentiation which is expected. And we believe that Internet of Things is not a place where there will be a lot of differentiation as opposed to analytics. Now, uh, is it the case that later on in the discussion we will speak about open APIs? Is it one of the next questions or do you want me to, to tackle with that right now? Why don't you take over? Yeah. Uh, no, because that, uh, I believe <laughs> there have been a big confusion between open source and open APIs. Okay? Open source means simply that one kind of software can be obtained by sharing some of the development, while open APIs is of a completely different nature, which is to facilitate the capability for third-party providers like uh, some of you uh, to be accessing some of the data in such a way they can create services as you shown in your diagram out of that. And what I would like to say about that is that if Fireware is an open source software, it is more something which I would call an open API capability which is facilitating the ability for third party providers to create services out of data which are collected potentially by others. And if I can extend a little bit about that, something we were discussing earlier on with Pierce Donoghue, I would like just to figure out for you in a minute what is happening these days in the payment environment. In the payment environment, very soon now, there will be a new regulation which is called PSD2. And this regulation is forcing every company which is providing and storing data on customer account to make this data available to third party company provided the customer has authorized it. So you understand it's a very different discussion why open source or not open source. It's simply the case that anyone who is capturing data has somehow the obligation, at least today in the payment environment, to make this data available through open APIs for other providers. So if you are, there are further questions on that, I believe I was simply willing to say clearly, Fireware is a set of open API facilitate the access to data by any third party provider. Okay, thank you. Um, access to data, uh, Lars, I think that's also a topic uh, the industrial data space is uh, tackling and not only the access to data but managing uh, data. So could you a bit elaborate on that and, and what's uh, the approach of uh, industrial data space and maybe how it could fit to the, to the targets of fireware as far as you learned a bit on, on fireware uh, today, yeah? Well, uh, I'm pretty sure that it, uh, that it fits to, to fireware and, and that uh, there are synergies between uh, both concepts. Um, well, for those who didn't already get that, what is the industrial data space? Uh, the Industrial Data Space Association is a non-profit uh, organization that is driven by industry and academia, uh, and our goal is to ensure trust for the data exchange and that uh, trust by design. We have a technical solution how to ensure trust uh, and we have governance uh, and rules of the game how to, to ensure that. So what we do is we have a technical solution. Uh, it's more or less a peer-to-peer -peer approach on uh, exchanging data um, and um, on, the, on the software implementation, we have container management so that we can be sure that the data doesn't leave the company at all. The, our approach and our insight is, um, as everyone today already told, 
um, uh, data is, is the gold of the 21st uh, century, and nobody wants to share it without knowing what happens with the data. And so the best thing is not to share data. But if you don't share data, uh, you, you don't uh, can uh, uh, get all the fruits you want uh, to have from, from Industry 4.0, or you never will uh, gain anything from the Lifestyle 4.0. And so everyone has to share data. We, find to, uh, we have to find the balance between the dare to share of, of data and of data ownership. And, and so we, uh, we have a solution where we can clearly state where does the data go, who receives the data, under which conditions. And uh, the second part, uh, beside this technological approach, we have a, the governance. Um, we have a certification uh, scheme, um, and we can uh, put contracts uh, inside the metadata description of, of the data where I clearly state what can happen with this data and perhaps at the end uh, how, how much money do I want to have for that data. And only in the case that me as a data provider have made the contract with a uh, data user uh, um, and, and we come together via our, our uh, clearing process and via our, um, uh, our, um, our certification scheme, uh, then data is exchanged or um, data isn't exchanged at all, but uh, via software injection, we inject software within the connector. This is uh, a piece of software we can provide at, at this point, and the operation will take place and in my IT infrastructure, and I just give the result of this operation outside. So the real data, which is uh, the core DNA of my company, doesn't leave the company at all. Okay. Chris, uh, maybe coming back to the question of open source and uh, which role open source can play in, uh, in the industry environment. Mm -hmm. Maybe your view from Belgium. <laughs> well, it's a <coughs> European view, actually. Um, just maybe uh, to, in a nutshell, describe where I'm coming from yeah. mm -hmm. sitting here. Um, so EFRA is the PPP Association for the Factories of the Future Public-Private Partnership, which is a European program similar to the Future Internet PPP, uh, Big Data PPP, there's Photonics Robotics. We started in 2010. Um, there's 245 European research projects that have started in the meantime, so it's really a big critical okay. mass. Um, this is about manufacturing. And, well, it's not a surprise to you that data in manufacturing is, is more and more important. And actually, I can say that as from 2010, many projects already had the Industry 4.0 in them. I mean, it's not a surprise. I mean, the community that started Industry 4.0 as a label, as a paradigm, was also in our community. Um, but that's a very diverse community. Manufacturing is so broad with already a lot of high-performance legacy systems. I mean, this industry was already using data acquisition, factory automation at many levels, but at high levels in many cases. So I think maybe the question also about open source is considering that whatever is being developed in the fireware context, it will have to live together with other systems, which are in many cases not open source systems at all. So, and this refers to the API, I think, that exactly. you refer to, that this is the, the, the global picture that we have to see it in. And that in many cases, even the digital platform is not a, not a platform that fits all use cases. There would be some verticals, maybe sector-oriented, maybe um, application-oriented, if you want zero-defect manufacturing, if you want to have data acquisition, or making your, your process more adaptable and, and things like this. So it, it's more a matter of, how the open source move can make the community bigger so that yeah. there's more apps to get benefit from and how to connect it to the legacy systems. Mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah, um, Uber, you confirmed the, the, the statement that uh, open source approaches like Fiverr uh, could enhance the commercial of the self, shelf uh, software like uh, available IoT platforms. And in the meantime, there are more than uh, 100 uh, IoT platforms available on the market um, as uh, closed source, so not as uh, open source. Um, 
So how do you think could, could an interplay work uh, between these two different approaches? Okay, so we need to realize where we are at this point of time. We will, as it has been said uh, by several uh, speakers today and by Gernot this morning, what is at stake is to combine production data, usage data, and customer experience feedback. This is the price to pay in order to build better services and better products. In order for that to happen, we need to realize that all these data are not coming from only one source, but they are coming from a group of companies which are creating de facto an ecosystem. If you take, for instance, in an airplane manufacturing like Airbus, there is all kind of ecosystem with the companies providing the jet engines, the company which are providing the seats, and the customer of Airbus, Lufthansa, on Air. If these companies are accepting to form an ecosystem through which they are sharing some of the data, then they have a chance to reap the benefits, the benefits associated to industry 4.0. Now, coming to your question, what will happen is that this ecosystem will be tooled by what we call industrial data platform, which is a platform for the B2B in the same way we have seen the platform from the B2C uh, for Booking.com, for Uber and so on. But unfortunately, the life is not such that there would be existing only one such platform. There will be one which will be pushed by Siemens, called Mindsphere. There will be another one which will be pushed by General Electric, which is called Predix. And therefore, what happened to all the customers who have to have first an interface to Predix, then an interface to uh, Mindsphere, so industrial data space is helping to sort out the question of metadata in order for data to mean the same thing in Predix and Mindsphere. But what we are addressing exactly to answer your question is what happened at the IoT level. Okay? In other words, if my friend Gernot is insisting that for Mindsphere, he need to have in the train one specific sensor and the guy of Predix are coming because they have some equipment also in the train and they insist to have their own sensors, you will have as many sensors that you have platforms and therefore the train will wait twice what it should wait. So we need to organize a way for data which has been captured by one sensor to be usable in other platforms. That is a price to pay to get the benefits of the industrial data platform. That's why we are working right now in the Fireware Foundation with the industrial data space uh, organization, not only to cover, I would say, the description of data and metadata, which is very, very important, but also to try to sort out this coexistence of IoT platform something the economists are calling the multi-homing. We are confronted to multi-homing and it will be terrible that the competition between two IoT platforms is stopping the capability of the industrial data platform to exist. Okay? Something you have all in your pocket for some of you, an Apple, for some of you, an Android, and you know that multi-homing has been sorted out. You can use the same application on all kinds of different platforms. Sorry, I've been long. No, no problem, no problem. Um, uh, maybe Lars, uh, could you a bit elaborate uh, on how industri the industrial data space concept uh, helps to overcome this, uh, what uh, Uber called the multi-homing issue, and uh, how it uh, simply works uh, to bring different platforms together. <clears throat> uh, yes, <laughs> I'd like to. Um, well, uh, 
the, the industrial data space um, from, from the reference architecture model um, uh, is quite, uh, quite simple and it's uh, very uh, identical to the, to the, uh, to the internet. Um, we like to say what we try to, to build up is a, is a secure uh, internet for the, uh, for the economy. Um, and um, it works nearly the same. You have uh, the access point to the internet, um, and we call it uh, to the industrial data space, it's the connector. And uh, the connector, it fetches data from somewhere uh, inside the company, uh, be it from, from the machine uh, or from an ERP systems or what, whatever. Um, and um, in this connector, the, the data is, is uh, secure. And with the container management, we can uh, safeguard this. And um, then, with, via this connector, I can uh, access the industrial data space, and, and I can find all others uh, who have access to the industrial data space too. Uh, and I can exchange data via the concept of the industrial data space, and we can uh, guarantee that uh, the, the data uh, stays at home and nothing bad happens with it. So. Um, for this concept, it's, it's a, the network is like a peer-to-peer -peer network, and um, we have some broker functionality to find new uh, participants in this network, because um, uh, one, one very important fact uh, in um, Industry 4.0 or in everything 4.0 is uh, to, to produce new businesses, to uh, gather new business models and to build them up, and therefore, I have to fetch new data, and I have to uh, collaborate with companies I didn't know before. And so, I need this uh, functionality of, of, of searching um, that, that is provided by the broker. And so, um, we have the, this functionality of a, of a marketplace at the end. And on the other hand side, uh, we have to share uh, and use uh, applications or, or apps and pieces of software. And therefore, um, that's the, the basic concept for an app store. What well, the industrial data, data space does not is uh, to, to run all those uh, instances. We don't run the app store and we don't run the broker. We just build the, the architecture and, and describe how this must, must work uh, so that everyone uh, can do the business as he, as he likes. And I think that, uh, that is the mm. very uh, good opportunity to, to cooperate with, with Fireware on this point. Um, but, but the question was the, the multi-homing issue. Um, well, what we built is um, we built a connector uh, system adapter uh, to all those cloud solutions, MindSphere, Predix, ThingWorks, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and so that if you have a piece of data uh, in this cloud, uh, you can put it in the secure connector, and from that point on, you can exchange the data uh, in a secure way as you, as you want it to. And um, with a, uh, under the, the rules of the game uh, I, I described before. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the core component of the industrial data space is this connector approach yes. that can be implemented into the different platforms and then have mm -hmm. a, a data space spread across different platforms. Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, Chris, um, coming back to, to Fiverr um, a bit, Fiverr is uh, quite well accepted uh, in the area of uh, smart cities. Um, in smart farming, and we are entering, entering um, for fiber at least, a bit a new domain with smart industry. Um, do you see some areas where fiber should focus on um, in the area of, uh, of smart industry? Well, maybe the first thing that's on my mind is maybe not an area, um, but it's, it's like the, you can call it a business case, or the, the convincing factor. It relates a bit to the open source question, but it's, it's just broader that, uh, I mean, the decision makers that need to decide on doing investments in, in IT infrastructure, they would always need to know what's my return when going for this or that solution. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, well, that applies to smart cities and to agro-food, but maybe even more, if I can say, because of the complexity for, for manufacturing. And the ability to, um, to make that business case 
to, to provide the examples where actually the decision makers for these investments would say, okay, it will make my life easier if I go for these solutions in terms of also the, the long-term extendability, for instance, of these solutions. I think that's one of the cases that Fiverr is making. Uh, I mean, yeah, the interoperability that is maybe being addressed. I think th it's these benefits, making those clear, that will then, I believe, open the opportunities. Um, I think technologically a lot is possible. Uh, I think, as, as many ever, or have already said, we're trying to get out of the way, uh, the, the, the method of having all the ad hoc connections, where you say, I connect a process to a higher level software system in my factory, I solved it for my factory, fine, but uh, ah, I have another factory, and that's using another ERP system. So, oh, I need to do the ad hoc again, and then I want to connect to different supply chain softwares. Mm. I mean, I think that's one of the, the business cases, if I understand it well. Mm -hmm. And making those clear is, is, is an important aspect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Janot, um do you think that the, the real business requirements from an CEO, COO point of view, like uh, shortening the time to market or uh, to go into a zero defect, flexible production, or to increase the sustainability of the whole production process, are sufficiently transferred into IT requirements? And uh, uh, is uh, there already a bridge between these business requirements and the capabilities we do have uh, with uh, uh, the, IT, uh, the IoT platforms and with the approaches of smart industry? Um, it depends on where you are in your steps of... The service continuum. Yes, yeah. that's right. If you want to be in the outcome area, it's not. Mm -hmm. If you are in the first three, it may be, because then you are, from my point of view, in the area of vertical domains. Inside of these domains, it's okay. You can do this by mind scale. You can do whatever you can think. But if you need additional information to make it better in efficiency by gathering additional information from other sides. For example, you know how many inhabitants you have in the city and you want to combine this with mm. agriculture because you want to have uh, the knowledge in advance what you have to produce in the next year, in the next five years, in the next ten years. You have to combine things with each other. And mm -hmm. these horizontal exchange of data and the connection of the vertical oriented domains is not sufficient today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Lars, within the industrial data space you have um, in the meantime, a lot of members of the association, so the association is uh, quite growing rapidly, um, having uh, different organizations, uh, large uh, companies and organizations, uh, and also smaller ones, uh, SMEs uh, in there. Um, do you see a difference in, in uh, on the one side, adapting these technologies, and on the other side, also driving uh, the further development of uh, of these approaches and technologies. Uh, for sure, there are there are differences. Um, um, what, what we uh, what we see uh, within the members of our association, um, first of all, they all have the insight that they have to move to the right side of, of yeah. the mm -hmm. uh, of, of the illustration, um, and, and they want to to go there. Um, and the, the members uh, in our association, they take different roles uh, within the uh, ecosystem of the industrial data space. Uh, the ones uh, are uh, data provider. They, they, are, they are sitting on a, on a treasure of gold and they don't know it. Well, they, they, they feel it, but they don't know what to do with it. And we have, uh, and that's the, the, the bigger the, the companies, um, they, they have, uh, an incredible treasure of, of data, and they, they would like to do more. But um, we live uh, in, a, in a social networked industry world. Um, industry works like, like social networks, and um, nobody makes business on its own, uh, and they uh, always do, just can do business in, in networks. And uh, that means you have to share data. And um, that, that's crucial uh, to, to be able to share data. And that's the approach uh, 
um, we strive for um, that everyone can can exchange data without uh, thinking about it and without having uh, bad uh, bad thoughts about that. Um, and so we have to combine all kinds of data. We have um, open data on the one hand side. We have something we call club goods um, from from some uh, ecosystems. Uh, and very individual company uh, data. And we must be able to put all those data together uh, to, to gain the, the effects everyone wants to, uh, everyone wants to gain. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, uh, to answer the question completely, the, uh, the smaller companies, well, or the SMEs, uh, they are uh, um, rather uh, innovative. Um, IT uh, companies who either run marketplaces or they know what to do with this kind of data and how to combine that data to produce new services. And on the other hand side, uh, we have uh, companies that produce uh, very interesting apps um, that uh, can be interesting for, for large companies um, uh, if they combine them with, with uh, some, some other um, uh, suppliers and uh, can they can build it in their in their own uh, products, and uh, these these apps uh, will be available in the in the app store, and uh, so we have very different um, uh, positioning of these companies within the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. As we are coming to the end of our time slot, um, maybe a, a final recommendation from your side. Um, what Fiverr should do, in which direction Fiverr should go in the area of uh, smart industry, maybe looking for, for synergies. Uh, so what's your final recommendation to the foundation and to the Fiverr community uh, short before Christmas? And Chris, uh, I'd like to start this time with you. All right. Well, I, I would like to come back to what I just said before. Um, the, the message of what fireware really is in a nutshell and what's the benefit of fireware building a crisp message that can transfer this message uh, I would say that would be one of the, the focuses I think technology wise there's a lot there mm -hmm. um, so I think it's part, part of it is conveying the message you can call it also a, an aspect of training maybe uh, on different levels but it's more the, the, the conveying of the message that there's something useful out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. uh, And, and we had the talk uh, at the lunch about exactly that. Um, uh, Mr. Spiegelberg, he had his, his um, illustration on, on how the world sticks together. We have this, this layer of data exchange that's industrial data space. We have the layer above where we have the uh, smart services uh, that, that don't address uh, just the verticals, but, but all verticals. And uh, on, on these platforms, uh, you have the, the verticals. Uh, we, we are talking about the whole day. Uh, and uh, the, the IoT platforms are mainly in these verticals. And I think Fireware can uh, have a strong position in these uh, combining platform uh, concerning smart services. And I think we have to, to bring this together uh, in an easy, understandable way and uh, communicate that. that there's something that, that fits together and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hubert. Going back to this uh, idea of open API, we have today two very separate worlds, which is exactly what you are explaining, the one of IoT and the one of analytics. It is clear that most of the industrial company will retain the analytics as a very proprietary, uh, non-open uh, kind of things, while IoT will be seen more and more as a plumbery, and no one is interested to have a special plumbery. We want a plumbery which is simply working, okay? Having said that, what we need to add on to that is that all these open APIs will find their real responsibility exactly as a junction between the analytics portion and the IoT portion, meaning that we need to have this uh, kind of capability, probably better explained as you requested, but I think in the meantime, we need to realize that while we are preparing ourselves, things are evolving very quickly. Today, the industry is specifically 
at the time where predictive analytics is commonplace, we do it in MindSphere, we do it in Predix, we are now entering the time of prescriptive analytics where commands would be given to actuators. So we need in Fireware to be able to handle prescriptive analytics in the same way we are dealing with predictive analytics. We need also to be prepared to recognize that when it comes to very basic connectivity, some standards are surfacing like OPC UA. So we need to have specific generic enablers enabling to have easy access to OPC UA. As well, we have several capabilities which are coming from new generation of IoT operation like Sixfox or LoRa. Sixfox and LoRa are excellent in terms of cost by endpoint, but they are a headache for programmers, so we need to somehow hide the Sigfox and LoRa constraint programming uh, from uh, the programmers. And finally, I would like to say, and it has been mentioned at a different uh, time, we are entering the time where we will have to merge what we do in security for IT and what we have done for years in security for OT. That should be part of the same kind of policy management this is not something which is yet fully understood. All that has to be done with what has been the absolute must in Fireware since the beginning. Each of the new generic enablers we are delivering should be extensively stress tested by, I would say, third party independent organization. Typically, all the generic enablers of Fireware has been stress tested by the Fraunhofer Focus, okay, which has delivered the report, which is available to every one of you. And we believe this is the right way to be sure that when you rely upon a generic enabler, you know it has been heavily tested and it can deliver. Thank you, Hubert. And finally, Gernot. Yes. Um, final word. Um, I guess uh, for small and medium enterprises and big companies as well. At any time, especially in our area here, we mentioned and discussed uh, smart industries. It's very important to deliver with lowest time to market, with a high quality, with high efficiency uh, products. And uh, to do this in the best way, um, we have to think about what can impact this kind of increase in efficiency by fiber, by IDS, by the combination of what we have to exchange between Predix and uh, MindSphere. It is not very, for me, it's not important to compete in this area. We have a lot of open goals and a lot of opportunities which we can grab together. Therefore, it's mm -hmm. a question of cooperation, not competition. And uh, therefore, I think in this area, we should find the way where fireware will be in the best way complement, com uh, uh, the best complement um, regarding what we have to deliver in the future. And uh, this has to sh be shown in real, uh, in, 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 in real transparency that everybody can understand where fireware will help in the best way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this uh, panel. Thank you very much for uh, participating here in this panel discussion on Industry 4.0. Uh, we will close this session now and uh, need uh, two, three minutes uh, to get the new panelists uh, on stage and get them the microphone. So thank you very much and up to the next one.